So, left off by saying how America has never seen a democracy, and that's true. Uh, uh, no Americans that I know, if you're under 50 years old, you've not seen the people out in the streets demanding, uh, you know, uh, yelling to get their demands heard. Uh, that has not happened. I have not seen this. Um, and actually, specifically, um, I mean, the 60s is what I read about, and I think that's the last time we saw some democracy. Maybe Seattle protest and, um, uh, you know, this Occupy movement. Uh, but before Occupy, we've never seen a democracy, so we don't know what democracy actually looks like. We don't know what rule by the people looks like. When Thomas Jefferson said that tyranny is when the uh, government is afraid of the people, or tyranny is when the people are afraid of the government, and freedom and democracy is when the government is afraid of the people, are using that as the litmus test, we are losing. We're losing. So if the tyranny, tyranny is when governments, uh, when the people is afraid of the government, that means uh, how are, are the people afraid of the police or are the police afraid of the people? And when the police are afraid of the people and the government's afraid of the people, then the people will get what they want. But when the people are afraid of the government, then the governments get what they want. So when we see this uh, ban on Occupy, the governments get what they want. There's no people out there to stop them from doing it. The government does whatever they want to do, and that's a lot of times that's what they do. They'll take it by force and then see if anybody challenges them, uh, you know, their actions. And usually it takes a lawyer or somebody else from the, the aristocracy, the owner class, right? So another thing about democracy, especially here in Louisville, 1975, the only time fucking white people stand up is to get some racist shit. So 1975, white people in Louisville, y'all stood up because they were going to send black kids to, to the white schools, right? Y'all y'all just couldn't handle that. Y'all went out in the streets, y'all were throwing you know, crap at the, you know, rocks at the cops, but y'all were throwing rocks at these kids on these school buses. Yeah, real brave, real great. Great white legacy there. Great legacy, white people, white Louisvillians. 1975, so we was actually 21 years later on Brown versus Board of Education anyways. And then this recent ruling, I think, undoes Brown versus Board of Education. Since busing was how we integrated, now they're taking away busing for integration purposes. So no Brown versus Board of Education has been overturned. So we're going back to the days of Jim Crow. We're going back to the days where the property taxes are used for school, and since the poor areas have less property taxes, that means more or less financing will, will happen at the schools. I think they're doing it by an economic basis, which they should do. They should send the rich kids to the poor schools and the poor kids to the rich schools, and I think that would integrate. I think that would work for integration. Um, if they're doing it by economic status, uh, that might be classes, you know, that they might say that's, uh, that's not fair. But so far, that has not been the case. Um, so, yeah, so democracy where uh, you have a consensus where you work in working groups and you work with other people and you cooperate and you talk to them and you dialogue and you figure out different solutions and strategies and you work to gain somewhere. I remember I wrote this paper, what I'm telling you right now, about seven, uh, eight months ago. And I, I, I talked to a couple folks and they was basically, I, I don't want to nah, I don't want to read it. I don't even want to look at it. <laughs> okay. Well, that's not good for dialogue. I mean, I, I was so excited about this uh, Occupy movement. I wrote this 14 pages, so I, I'm not sure how long I'll actually be able to speak on this. I'll probably be able to speak on it for like an hour or so. Um, uh, but, like, I had nobody to talk to about it, and all that. this stuff is good stuff. So, yeah, yeah, so that's what we have right now. Jef Jefferson County, Louisville Metro, where it's tyranny. The cops rule the roost, and the people are afraid. And actually... Uh, Franz Fanon, Franz Fanon, he wrote the a colonized book about Africa and the decolonization movement there, and he said that even though they hated their oppressors and they hated the colonizers, they also had this strange ad admiration for them, but in, because they couldn't destroy them, they couldn't conquer them, and instead of standing up to their oppressor, they would fight each other. The colonized uh, Africans would fight each other just to feel like they were human, just to have some sort of motor kind of feeling or like they were doing something. And I see the West End. I see the same thing out of the West End. They're attacking, you know, uh, there's a lot of violence that's happening in their own community, uh, but there's also violence happening to them by the 75% uh, mostly white male police force. So if they're having, you know, issues with the police, but they're not confronting the police, are they fighting each other because they're all being collectively oppressed and it's in order to feel human, that's what you have to do. I don't know, something to think about. Frederick Douglass, he said, those who profess to favor freedom 
and yet they depreciate agitation are people who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it could be both, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Frederick Douglass also said something about how human nature can only pity something for so long until, unless it shows some degree of power. So if you think you're always going to be nice and sweet and pleasant and, you know, get someone's pity in order to get them to do something, that's how you manipulate people. Feel sorry for me so that way you'll do what I want to, you to do. If that's the way you manipulate people, it won't work because eventually they'll just, you know, not like you. Human nature is such a way that they can only pity you for so long. But when you stand up and you say, no, I'm fighting these circumstances, I'm going to do something about it, that's when people will start to admire uh, uh, look up to you, you know, not pity you, and they'll be more likely to help you in that circumstances too. So that's Frederick Douglass. Margaret Mead, she has an awesome ass quote: "Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that has." Mario Savo, he uh, he had an awesome, awesome quote. He's out of the 60s or 70s. Berkeley, Mario Savo, he says. We're the raw materials, and there's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious and it makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And that's why you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels and upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Mario Savo. I think it's also instructive to look at the 1848 European revolutions. Chomsky says that there's no precedent for what's going on right now. There has been precedents. I think there's several things that you could think about with the Occupy revolutions. Uh, you could think about Africa's decolonization movement. That's when one country started protesting, and then you had a wave of protest. And then, I think, 60s or 70s, within one decade, most of the colonized countries were no longer colonized. So that's something to look at. The color revolutions, where the Eastern European countries broke out in protest uh, in defense of democracy and freedom that was a wave of democratic uprisings and the best one the best one i think is the 1848 revolutions the 1848 revolutions was a karl marx inspired revolution i, I don't want to give him all the credit but he, that was the same year he wrote communist manifesto and 50 years broke out all across uh europe including some in the americas there is a there's some in the americas that broke out so it's instructive to look at the 1848 European revolutions, the springtime of nations, uh, which is similar to the Arab Spring. Uh, I guess the uh, 1848 European revolutions would kind of be the white Arab Spring. That was the springtime of nations. So that's when the Germans became Germans and the French become French and the Spanish become French or Spanish people. So like they started identifying themselves with a certain nationality. They started recognizing themselves as citizens, as being separate from their oppressors. Um, that's why it's called the springtime of nations. The 1848 revolutions, uh, European revolutions had failed, but they had succeeded in changing the consciousness and showing folks that there can be, we can have a different world, a different world is possible. A lot of us want something different to go on. So it's important to review history so that the past revolutionaries' mistakes are not repeated. The springtime of nations started out as a revolutionary wave, and it began in France in February. And then it immediately spread to most of Europe and in parts of Latin America. Over 50 countries were affected, but there's no coordination or cooperation among the revolutionaries. Five factors were involved, very similar to today, the, the wide dis, uh, widespread dysphatic five factors of the 1848 European revolutions, the widespread dissatisfaction with the political leadership, Luba Metro government sucks, the demand for more participation in democracy, the, the demands of the working class that we want more democracy, which is true here in Kentucky, 12% is the only vote, and we need more democracy in Kentucky. Uh, the demands of the working classes need to be heard with, with the union rates of 9%. Our, we're not being heard at all. We're not heard in the workplace, and our union bosses and our government most especially are not hearing us. Uh, you have the upsurge of nationalism, so you got more people that are starting to look at who they actually are and taking pride in who they are. 
Uh, I see sort of an anti-nationalism nationalism in America. When I see the Occupy crowds, I see a wide swath of diverse uh, people, not just a bunch of uppity, snobbish Republicans, but a lot of um, regular regular folks, not just hippies, but regular, you know, uh, uh, suit and tie folks and hippies and goth and athletic and old, young men, women, straight, gay, black, white, everybody. Everybody's coming out. Everybody was coming out. Um, so nationalism, and uh, I'm also a German, so I'm breaking the white structure. I'm upsurging my own nationalism, and finally the regrouping of the reactionary forces based in the royalty. Uh, the aristocracy, the army, and the peasants. And that's what we're seeing now. You're seeing the reactionary components. So the occupation of the lawns wasn't able to make any institutional changes, but that isn't going to stop Mayor Fisher and the Metro Council from trying to fuck them over from doing it ever again. Uh, the uprisings were led by shaky ad hoc coalition of reformers, the middle classes, and the workers, but it could not hold together for too long. So we, uh, the, the white Arab Spring is important for Louisville because we face the exact same issues. A defunct political leadership, demand for more participation in democracy, working class demands, upsurge of nationalism or like a counter Tea Party nationalism, the regrouping of reactionary forces based in the aristocracy or the plutocracy in the police and the peasants. So we see that, that, uh, that regrouping. Our city and state governments are embarrassing. Our turnout rate was 12% for our governor's election, and that's that's not we can't be bragging about 12%. That means the majority of our people don't participate. That's not a democracy. That is, rule by the demos is ruled by the majority. That's the demos is the people, the majority, which means 50.1%. You know, over 50%. So do not participate in American government. Working classes are being attacked, which the unions are called. Uh, they call it the war on workers because that's what's happening in Wisconsin, Ohio, and other states. They even tried it here at the council, city council. I think that was actually stopped. So the labor unions have some flack when it comes to the uh, city council. Uh, nine Louisville city councilmen, Republicans, and all Republicans voted in favor of destroying the unions. They wanted to start the war on the workers. Gatewood Galbraith's plan for... Uh, uh, Kentucky would have took the poorest state in America from, uh, to the richest state. It would have got $5,000 for every potential college student. Occupy Wall Street is against the Wall Street bailout, and they're also against the uh, economic inequality, which is identical to the demands of the working classes. So 1848 revolutions and today we had a similar conditions. It's been Grimm's fairy tales the whole time. Grimm's fairy tales coming out that time. That's uh, Hands on Gretel. So Hands on Gretel, they had a mother who uh, d didn't have any food in the house. And so instead of like going out and finding more food or, you know, sh uh, starving with her kids, she pulls her kids out into the middle of the woods and leaves them off to die. So that way she can eat the last bit uh, the last morsels of bread herself, so that way the kids were another mouth to feed that was taking away her own food. So when your own mother is sending you out in the woods to die, those are some poor conditions. But there's, you know, there's been progress. I'm not going to say that we're still like old Europe, but there is also lots of poverty. So some of us haven't progressed, uh, been given a chance to progress at all. So the, it's always been poor versus rich. We do have a middle class, but the middle class has become working class and working class is becoming poor and are you going to wait until you become poor before you start worrying about the poor i think the poor and the working class and middle class have very similar interests especially since you know 90 over 90 percent of the people work for somebody else so over 90 percent of the people are working for somebody else you're employed from someone uh, someone else for a job and you're working from paycheck to paycheck you lose that job you're out on the street just like fun with dick and jane with jim carrey fun with dick and jane shows uh, how you get used to a certain lifestyle and you spend a lot of money and then as soon as you're fired you ain't, you don't have nothing. So uh, working paycheck to paycheck, working for somebody else is something that most Americans can understand. So we're, we're mostly, we're all working people, right? Most of us, 90% of us are working people. That's what was going on in 1848. Working people uh, represent over 90% of America, but unions only represent 9%. So unions are what traditionally has represented working people. The unions are on the ropes and they're faced with extinction. One of the faults of the 1848 revolutions, and I saw this uh, downtown too, uh, was that the middle class was not able to inspire the masses. They were elitist and they were too intellectual and they didn't have the theorems rooted in reality. So I saw that in Occupy. 
You want to tell a bunch of poor people all about, you know, all these crazy theorems. Well, what about democracy and consensus? Do you know about those theorems? And I think democracy and the process and consensus should reign over um, any any silly thoughts uh, that you may have learned, you know, in college. So, more Occupy coming up.